Um, so I'm going to get to the heart of it first. I mean, when I think about innovation, Europe and regulators, or like European bodies and regulators are two of the, the kind of words that don't exactly sing innovation to me. Am I wrong? Well, I hope you're not, but I hope you are at the same time. You know, let me try to be clear. If we don't have an explicit mandate to foster innovation, so that's why maybe you, we don't come to mind at the same time, but we cannot be ignorant of innovation and we cannot be either uh, obscure to innovation. You know, we have to tackle innovation within the context of our mandate, which is basically financial stability in my case, and particularly banking stability. You know? So I think what does it mean within that context? We need to approach it like we approach all other areas of stability which is from a risk-based approach. Think about innovation, what are the risks that it brings to the system, you know, and try to tackle those risks on a fair and accurate way. The way I like to say is technologically neutral, which basically means trying not to implicitly through our regulations uh, put a bias or foster either newcomers versus incumbents or particular types of firms or particular states of technologies that come to market. Yeah, because I mean, we had a chat here earlier, we were talking about the, the future of finance and the kind of balance between not trying to stifle something but keeping the system safe. So, I mean, can you think of examples where you've fallen down on one side or the other or where you've, you've had to take action to stop something from happening? Well, I'll give you an example. Exactly, there's always this, like this type one and type two errors, you know, by yeah. which so like you, you act too much and therefore you prevent innovation, and the other one you don't act enough, and then you at the threat of that you result in financial instability. So it's, it's hard to act to balance. I'll give you an example. In the crypto world, for instance, you know, we have big announcements from 2006 and 2017, and, and 15, after 2015 and 2016, sorry, you know, that we were concerned about the, the existence of these new innovations, not from the point of view of financial stability, but from the point of view of customers and adequate information to customers and being customers aware of where the products that were being offered and being challenged. Now, in the last year, actually, we shifted gears a little bit, and we sent a note to the commission, but we say, you no, know, we're concerned that some of these crypto innovations currently do not exactly fall within the current range of, of regulations that we have. They have characteristics of payments, so it will fall within the payment regulation, if it's e-money or something like that, or there could be investment products, and they will, will fill within the investment regulation, mainly Europe within MIFID, but some of them have characteristics that fall in between, so we should make an assessment, and you should put forward regulation to try to address them better. So, so on your first point, does the EPA have a mandate around risk to the consumer? We do have, as part of our, our mandate, you know, uh, make sure that we have mainly financial stability, but to the extent that consumer issues may raise prudential issues, okay. that's, an, uh, that's a hook. There's a kind of a feedback loop yes. there, I guess. So is your role partly to save your banks from themselves? I'm sorry, sir. Is your role partly to save your banks from themselves? No, it's not my role to save banks from themselves. <laughs> I think banks are very good at saving for themselves, and they should be very good. My job is well, to make sure. Well, not always. Well, not always, but they, at, to, at that stage, it's not my job to not to prevent them from failing. My job is to, do, to prevent them from causing damage if they fail beyond their own failure. So do you look at stuff like, say, the kind of infrastructure risks banks take on when they adapt certain kinds of technology? That's a very important aspect, absolutely. You know, so, for instance, we put like guidelines on, on ICT and outsourcing of ICT technology. So that's, so that's all, example. So by um, ICT, you mean like the cloud, those kind of things? Exactly, or? Like moving, moving technology, moving information, moving part of their uh, process into the cloud. That's an example in which we said, you know, first we said, you know, uh, banks should be responsible for the whole value of the chain. So in their contractual arrangements with these cloud providers, they should have the ability to make sure that they can oversee how the cloud providers is doing adequate risk assessment of what they're doing. Beyond that, they have to have the ability to allow the supervisors if they want to, to go through the whole value of the chains and go to these cloud providers. That was the first stage. Now we're actually in the second stage in which we are actually concerned. And again, we send a message to the commission on this front and with this concentration of these cloud providers, there are very few of them, yeah. you know, and that may lead to concentration risk and as a result of that may lead to systemic risk and that requires in itself probably uh, to look into an adequate regulation. So how coordinate, because one of the things I hear, because I cover banks in the US, but I also, a lot of them have transatlantic and global operations. And one of the things I consistently hear is the idea of not having a level playing field globally. How concerned are you that, say on something like, say, cloud, if you introduce certain po policies and restrictions, that those do not disadvantage European banks versus like US banks versus Asian banks? And is there a global coordination between yourselves at, the, at, at either like the financial stability board level or some other level around that? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a real concern, to be honest, for us. It's something which I think all regulators are aware of and they're working. Innovation, current innovation has three characteristics which I think are 
are challenged. You know, one is the time to market is very fast, and they get very fast to a massive. And regulations are no offense. Well, that's usually the case. Mm. You know, the second aspect they tend to be cross border in nature. Many of these of these regula- of these innovations, and the third one they tend to be also cross sectoral. Now, when you think about me, here I'm representing the European Banking Authority. So, first of all, I, I'm an authority, but that's the least important part. I represent the sector and a particular region. And by banks, your definition of banks is what we would call like the um, like deposit-taking institutions. Correct. Correct. That's a bank. A bank is an entity that, regardless of other things that they may be doing, they're taking deposit from uh, customers or from citizens, and as a result of that, they're entitled to a certain amount of privileges, like having access to the central bank, yeah. you know, and then they're exposed to our regulation. Because as we think about innovation and the world that the overall f- and how the overall financial services ecosystem is evolving, I mean, does it even make sense to have a separate thing to regulate bank entities versus other entities carrying out similar things to banks? Like, should it be more activity-based than entity-based? It is true that activity-based should be the focus of regulation, and that's an, a big target on our goal. You know, the same activity should have the same regulation. I'll give you an example. For instance, we, we as Banking Authority, we also have responsibility for payments and for payments institutions, which is more activity-based. Okay. We have banks and not banks that are engaging in payments activities. But it's also true that it's not, you can't just stay at the situation which the same activity requires the same regulation because the same activity performed by different firms may imply different risks. So therefore, you know, the same activity that, arise, that arises with the same risk should require the same regulation. But the same activity, if, if a yeah. bank performing a payment may put at risk... Yeah, savers, widows and Savers, orphans. customer deposits, then the risks are different, the regulation should be different. That's difficult, because then you have the level playing field argument as well to try to measure. Well, it's difficult. It's not. Nobody's forcing anybody to do multiple activities. Fair point. Um, the other issue that came up earlier is the need for like, regulators themselves to embrace innovation in terms of their own processes, how they engage with industry, how they view risk. How kind of forward-thinking is the EBA in its own activities and its own operations? Well, that's, as you say, it's a very important area, and here we are basically taking three approaches. One is we need to form our own people. You know, if you, if you have people that are not, and, that, and that's a, an advice we give to our banks in terms of their supervision, you know, that governance of innovation is very important, and having adequate knowledge at the highest level of the organization on those innovations is very important to make sure that they have adequate governance within the organization as those innovations get implemented. We should be doing the same. And we've, been tra- doing do- we've been doing training of our staff and with the training of our 28 uh, national authorities, 27, 20? yeah, 27, 27 yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, fraudulent sleep. They left, 27 plus, me, plus us is 28, no? <laughs> so that's, 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 that's one aspect that we do. You know, the second aspect we created, you know, we have a half for the European Framework for Innovation, you know, which, which work jointly with the other ESAs, with ESMA, which regulates security, so Europe, our regulates insurance, in which we bring forward innovators in the industry to try to learn and get best practices from them. That's the second aspect in which we're working to try to make sure that we stay on top of the regulation. And then the third aspect is we're trying to assess ourselves, you know, and also in the mind of the legislators, how we actually interact with the industry and how to use better technology. Just to give you two examples, now we have a mandate to do an analysis and a feasibility study for banks, in my case, to do integrated reporting, so that they do an integrated reporting to all the different uh, prudential supervisors that they're reporting to, national, yeah, that would be very supernational. Helpful. That would be helpful. Let's see if we can accomplish that. And another aspect in which we have the requirement that we, need, we should reduce between 10 and 20 percent the burden on reporting requirement for small and non-complex institutions. Yeah. So one of the other things I touch upon a lot, because I, I covered the big Wall Street banks, and they tell me privately they find it very hard to hire the really good innovation people, the really strong people with the really strong technical skills. How does the EBA compete with Goldman Sachs and Facebook for tech talent? We don't compete with them. We don't compete with them. I mean, we are, first of all, we're a very small institution, just to give you the But number. your people need to be able to understand the kind of with science that the banks are presenting you. We, remember, we are regulators, we do not supervise. Okay. The supervisors are the ones that are engaging directly with the banks. Yeah. So we don't really engage directly with the banks, we just have regulation. We didn't need to be aware of the where the technology goes so that we make sure that the regulations and ways you know, doesn't have bias, as I said before, towards the status quo or reluctance to innovation. And at the same time, it's sufficiently uh, careful about making sure that innovations that may give rise to new risks or all risks that find a different way are adequately managed. So you find that you're able to hire the talent that you need for that function? I think that we are able to, I think that we are able to hire the talent. I think that at the same time we're able to pull from a pool of talent, which is the 27 
other national competent authorities that collaborate with us. You know, most of our work we do always through networks and groups in which we involve all the 27 authorities, and that's a big source of knowledge for us. And do you draw much on the international on the international regulatory community outside the EU27? Yes, we do. I mean, the, here, but part of the challenge here, to be honest, is that as we talk about the international regulatory community, we have a long history, a relatively long history of well-established international collaboration, global collaboration in traditional supervision, particularly in prudential supervision. Yeah. Everybody knows Basel. You know, everybody knows the Basel. Not yeah. everybody, but most people. It's in a very fun place, really, once yes. you get used to it. <laughs> now, uh, we're not as good and we're not as well developed in other areas that are becoming very important. Like, for instance, I'll give you in cyber risk, cyber resilience. There's not really any global body yet equivalent to Basel. That's, That's kind of scary. International standard. I agree. On data, data privacy and data consumption, that's also another area in which we, we have to make progress and we have to be able to create more common standards. Europe went quite ahead by generating GDPR. Some people will say it's controversial, but that's, at least it's a, it's a strong signal on what direction it should be going. And the third aspect, I think, so some aspects of financial crime as well. Yeah. So those are all risks, I guess, that you have to think about as you think about your institutions and Correct. where innovation is going. Correct. So, for instance, you know, when, you th when we think about our risk map and when we talk about you know, risk maps by, by the supervisory authorities, cyber risk, AML risk are very high on those risk maps. And it's not strictly in the innovation area, but how do you view the climate risk and how that affects your, your We view that and we put forward a, what we call our agenda for, for ESG for the next five years. You know, basically, uh, just to make it short, is, uh, our approach right now is that first, banks need to start talking about what is it that they have. You know, so that's what is this common taxonomy that has been already built. So banks will start by disclosing, and not just what is it that they have in their balance sheet, but also where do they want to be in four or five years, where do they see themselves going. Second step, they need to start putting governance in place and be able to assess, mod by modeling techniques, their risk, their implicit risk. We're at the early stages of that. That needs to be developed. You know? I, our ourselves are also working, and we have the commitment to try to do uh, first attempt of a, I wouldn't want to call it a stress test, but at least a sensitivity analysis towards the... Call it a stress test. We, okay. for a stress well, test. the price that we have, we are running EBA, as you know, a stress test, and we have our regular every two years stress test. Ireland is very 2020. familiar with our stress tests. Yeah. PCAR and PILAR. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to do some kind of... A so we want to do some test. analysis, and we'll interact with banks on a voluntary basis this year to try to start learning from that process. And down the line, would there be an argument for having an additional capital charge for banks that had, that were, say, overweight assets which were sensitive to climate change? I think the key point, as you say, is, is first it has to be risk-based. Yeah. You know, it has to be assessed as the adequate risk. And as you said, you know, it's probably down the line because first we need to be able to measure the risk. And I just told you that we we're in yeah. the stages of having the, the good, really good techniques and methodologies to be able to assess those risks. And I guess the good thing is that we're now like five years into the European White Stress Test. The banks should have pretty good data, I guess, compared well, to but, 10 years ago. Like. No, but they have data of the traditional, what I would call the traditional risk profiles of banks, credit, market, operational, cyber resilience, yeah. of that sort. But of course, part of the challenge of measuring this new risk is not just that there's no historical data, is that the uncertainty about what the under underlying regulatory environment in which the, the portfolios entities, of the banks yeah. have will operate is very high. And that's a big de determinant of the risk. I guess you just have to model that somehow, but yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you have to do, as I said, we're in the early stages, but basically uh, we need to start walking that path. Awesome. So we have about four minutes left, um, told to me by the trusty clock. And have we got any questions from the audience about the European Banking Authorities? Um, approach to innovation or to anything else while we have the chairperson here. Uh, yep, yeah, gentleman here at the front, thank you. Uh, we'll have a, a mic to you in a second just for the benefit of the people in the back of the room. Hi, um, does the Legal entity identifier um, come into things at all in terms of getting visibility into what's going on in the economy? Well, the legal entity identifier is an initiative that you know that we have been keen in supporting. We're helping to push forward, we collaborate with them. You know, it's a process that has been implemented so far, I would say, um, unevenly across the different countries. You know, and the stand that's being used is also unevenly, but it's one mechanism that we think will help over the medium and long term, you know, to tackle some of the issues that we're challenging, particularly when I think about issues of cross-border facility to communicate and also crime prevention. Okay, thank you very much. And um, have we any other questions? Yep, yeah, lady here towards the front. And we'll get a mic to you in just one second. Thank you. 
Good afternoon. I wanted to ask about the EU stress test. Um, UK is currently included in the 2020. So what will happen from 2021, or is it going to happen in 2020 itself? And what about the future divergence of the regulations for passporting and such? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, as, as you said, in the 2020 stress test, the EU is included. It's part of the transition arrangement that was undergone within the, within the UK, which, as you know, throughout this year, they are, uh, from our perspective, you know, they're supposed to, they're complying with European regulations and European rules still, and they also have reporting requirements. As part of the reporting requirements, you know, we thought it was good that they would be included in the stress test for this year. Beyond that, we do exercises every two years. So the next one more likely will be by 2022. You know, it will depend at that time. By that time, it will depend if the current transitional arrangement will to continue then, which is not the expectation right now, then we we'll probably will be part of the exercise. If they don't, if they left formally already and they're not subject to, require, to as I said, reporting requirements within the EU regulations, they probably won't be. Like, as of today, they're no longer part of our decision-making bodies because they're not part of the EU. So could they have a role similar to the Nordics, where they're there but not there? Well, it's, it's slightly different. As I said, you know, transition right now, it's uh, the, the Nordics, they participate in our board. So yeah. sir, the Nordics, you mean by Nordics, you mean non EU members? Yeah, the non EU Nordics. Nordics Norway, which is Iceland. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the UK will be a non EU, so it could be a silent observer on your board. Right, but right now they don't, they don't have that, that status yet. Okay. Right now, the status that they have is that they're a non member of the EU, but while they're complying with EU regulations. Got it, okay. Thank you very much. Have we one final question and then we'll close the session. Lady at the front and the mic is quite close to you, which is very convenient. Thank you. Hi, a question about UK again. So what, it works, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, you know, if we look at investment banks, European arms, trend is uh, middle office, back office is moved to continental Europe, and as of now, a lot of front office activities still stay in London or UK. How will it affect um, your job when it comes to, you have one entity with different departments, divisions being located within you and outside to you? Because at the end of the day, we talk about one unit, for example, let's say Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs or alike. If you understood my question, I hope. Yeah, I, well, I, I hope you. so. I don't, I don't know. Let me try to give an answer at least or, or uh, explanation. First of all, when you think about, I mean, there are many banks, currently European banks, EU banks, that are operating in geographies outside the EU. Particularly, you can think of the United States. There are many banks operating in the United States and other countries. So that's not novel. That's not different. Now, when we think about the UK banks, and, this, and when you think about the transition, here is, it's more the role of, of the direct supervisor. I'm going to talk from the messages that the SSM has sent publicly. You know, they've been very clear and they've been working on preparation on this by which, you know, banks that are EU-based or SSM-based in this case, you know, we have a risk there. They should have adequate risk management, adequate staff, adequate resources, adequate controls within the SSM jurisdiction, i.e. within the EU jurisdiction, countries of the SSM, so as to confront those activities, even if some of those activities are performed outside of the SSM area or EU, in this case, the UK. So that's what they've been working on. That's what they've been engaging on. The national supervisors, the SSM, or if it's outside the SSM, the other national competent authorities are supervising them under the expectation that they need to have, as we like to say to make it simple, data, people, and technology in place to make sure that the controls are there. And by in place, within me, within the EU jurisdictions. Okay, thank you very much for that. And we are just coming out of time again, so thank you so much for your time. I'm going to hand over now to Arthur Beasley, my colleague, who will take the next panel. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Laura.